I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, Ms. Sheffield, in my district in North Texas, I've heard countless constituents, you know, they, they complain, I, I mean, I feel it myself, about the cost of things. And um, that, like, for instance, I believe, roughly speaking, uh, the average uh, gasoline across the country was $2.39 when this administration took office. And it's now, depending on where you are, national average is about $5. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't that. It was in June of last year. It's a little lower than that now. What examples like this, what does it say about the quote-unquote success or lack thereof of the Biden administration's economic policies? Yeah, I would say... Uh, um, I would say just looking at the numbers, uh, but go, going beyond the numbers as well, just talking to people that uh, the headline inflation um, is certainly not actually how families feel and how they're actually experiencing uh, when you're talking about uh, food inflation, uh, fuel inflation, uh, you know, my esteemed colleague, with all due respect, his graph that he has here when he's comparing the inflation uh, to other countries, it excludes energy, food, and housing, which are pretty much what you need to survive. So I Would it be fair to say those three things are main yes. economic drivers? Absolutely, and yeah. especially for the people that are in your district, um, that those are, that's the, the personal, it's their everyday life. Um, and so that's why Bidenomics is failing them. Um, Mr. Anthony, um, what's, what's been the impact of the expiration of the expanded child tax credit on poverty, and what has been the impact on inflation, uh, the, the impact of inflation on poverty? Thank you. The, um, in terms of inflation, well, I think we'll probably best to discuss that one first, because inflation is actually the only thing that can increase the poverty threshold. And so as inflation has outpaced earnings during the Biden administration, it has caused more people to fall below that poverty threshold. Uh, that, that is literally just what the numbers tell us. The, there is nothing else that can increase that poverty threshold. In, in terms of the uh, expansion of the child tax credit, you would expect that once that went away, that you would simply return poverty rates for children to the level that they were at previously. But that's not what we've seen. We've instead seen the rate go much higher. And again, the reason for that is because inflation has pushed that threshold so high that many people's nominal earnings haven't kept pace with inflation and have therefore fallen below the threshold. And uh, while we're visiting, what's the impact of supply chain distributions on inflation? Disruptions, rather. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in, in terms of uh, supply chains, you know, the, the disruptions there, uh, it's, it's a very, well, let me put it this way, it's very similar to, to what we just said on, on poverty in that if supply chains really were the only driver behind inflation, if it had nothing to do with fiscal and monetary stimulus, then once those supply chain issues were resolved, uh, not just inflation would come down, but prices would come down. Prices would simply return to where they were previously, and that's not what we've seen at all. Actually, the last several uh, reports from S&P Global, their purchasing manager index that analyzes global supply chains, showed that there is no more pandemic era uh, in impact in terms of supply chains. In other words, things are back to normal, and yet prices are not. And the reason for that is because the fiscal and monetary conditions today are not back to where they were. So you're saying that there's the too much, there's an increased uh, money supply, and the, the goods and service, the goods are out there, they're, they're remain steady. So when you have more money relative to the goods, the goods cost more it, in very exactly. simplistic terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's easy to wrap your, your mind around it. Now, is it true that real weekly earnings have exceeded inflation, the annual rate of inflation, for 26 of the 31 months of the Biden administration? Yes, it is. You, you can see on page six of the testimony that I submitted, only the first two months of the Biden administration and now the, the most recent three months have seen positive annual real earnings compared to inflation. But in the 26 months in between, it was negative, which is a record. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mulligan, you're an expert in economic growth. That's uh, one of the purviews, of course, of this committee, as well as regulatory reform, yet another purview of this committee. Um, before the pandemic hit, the Trump administration demonstrated some of the most pro-growth policies uh, that we've seen in generations. Have the, uh, how has the Biden administration policies reversed the uh, possibility of growth and what we need, what do we need to do right now to get on the, the right track and get our economy moving again? Um, the, really, the, all the policy levers have been 
pushed in the opposite direction of, of President Trump to the extent they could. President Trump had a tax cut um, that needs some renewing, I guess, and that might not happen. A lot of the regulations have been totally reversed. Um, not all of them. Um, and all both of these things go toward reducing productivity. Rather than productivity growing, you see, like you see in energy where we're pumping more and more and more, um, we're less productive. We're less able to do what we used to do. Uh, my, time is, my time has expired. I yield to the ranking member for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. St. Louis and I are here today because our economy needs to fully recover from the devastating effects of the pandemic. Housing is the bedrock of our nation's economy. One of the biggest challenges facing St. Louis and communities across the country is a dire shortage of affordable housing. When, when landlords raise rents, my constituents face increased housing insecurity and the threat of eviction. Renters in St. Louis and around the country are forced to contend with Wall Street investors who buy up homes in the area, jack up rents, and neglect building maintenance, all to extract greater profits. Private equity firms took advantage of unprecedented foreclosures during the 2008 recession, which forced millions of people from their homes. These corporations seized on historically low interest rates to purchase foreclosed homes. Local landlords and small business developers have been muscled out of the local housing market. In 2022, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch estimated that out-of-state investors owned nearly 34,000 single-family homes in the region. Investors have doubled the percentage of homes they own in my district over the last 10 years. In one housing complex in my district called Ridgeview Apartments, the property has changed hands at least four times in the last three years. This wreaks havoc on residents and creates a dire lack of accountability. Ridgeview residents report there's so little communication that some people realize too late that they were sending their rent checks to the wrong place. And it's difficult to keep track of who their landlords are. The St. Louis area is experiencing a housing crisis and evictions are at the highest level in years and still on the rise. Wall Street specul speculators have turned places like Ridgeview from homes for families into assets on their balance sheets. Working families can no longer afford to buy or even rent many places that were previously affordable. Mr. Kogan, what are the advantages of home ownership for building household and generational wealth? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Mm -hmm. uh, home ownership is one of the best ways for families to build wealth and to pass on intergenerational wealth. And to the extent that we have seen policies in U.S. history, such as redlining, that have um, discriminated against uh, against people in the United States, this this thing that is supposed to work for everyone has been limited to a certain cohort. And to the extent that the economy does not work for a, a whole a whole host of Americans, then it is not working for Americans. Home ownership is beneficial because it um, it allows you to it, it's for savings. It allows you to build equity, and it also pushes costs away from when you are stuck in a fixed income later, and pushes it to when you're more able to afford it. And so, as as stuff, um, sorry, as as home equity, um, as private. As, I'm sorry, as yep. private equities come and um, buy up a lot of the housing stock, this limits the ability of individuals to capitalize on this ability to take advantage of these mechanisms. So as the forced savings goes away, um, folks are not able to kind of um, to use that. Um, sorry, thank you. No, you know, you're fine. Um, and I think you started to hit on this point, but uh, um, Mr. Kogan, how would you say that private equity snapping up these housing makes it more difficult for the average American to um, fam family to purchase a home? Like you started there, but if you could go a little further with that. Sure. Um, so typically, a lot of people will be able to build. Uh, so will be able to buy from an individual um, with a whole lot of buyers um, or a whole lot of sellers. There's kind of a broad ability. You can shop around. You can find someone who fits whatever whatever you're looking for. And to the extent that more and more of the housing stock is being bought up by a few select companies, we're moving towards. We're moving closer and closer to a, mon a monopsony where they're able. A few sellers are able to. Um, set all the prices. And so through this, it is limiting kind of the ability for folks to shop for what they need and able to find what they can do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The Biden-Harris administration is working to address this problem. The administration's housing supply action plan will reduce barriers for families to access housing by expanding financing for low-income and climate-ready housing and promoting the conversion of unused commercial space to residential space. Moreover, the American Rescue Plan, 
that not a single one of my Republican colleagues voted for included the HOME program, which will add at least 20,000 units of affordable housing across the United States while supporting 23,000 households with rental assistance. Congressional Democrats and the President have taken fundamental steps that support American families. Far too many people struggle to secure basic housing, and yet our colleagues across the aisle and their, their type of economics seek to cut taxes for the wealthy and cut services for those in need. It is absolutely shameful, but I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Now recognizes Mr. Edwards of North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Sheffield, we, in, in opening comments, I heard that uh, inflation since uh, Joe Biden had been our president had increased. I, I heard somebody testify 16.6%. I heard somebody testify 17.1%. Uh, what are folks, and I also heard uh, testimony that the additional cost for many of the things that people have to buy now is being financed on their credit cards. What is the uh, what's the long term effect of one trillion dollars in credit card debt? Where are we headed? Uh, it's extremely corrosive uh, to building intergenerational wealth uh, to have, you know, especially rollover balances from month to month uh, and having to pay these very high interest rates. So uh, it's, it becomes this, this hole that you can't dig out of, and that's really the, the hole that is the fruit of Bidenomics to pile on consumer debt onto families. Uh, in terms of housing, I think it's important because housing is, you know, quite often the largest budget chunk of the family budget. Um, first of all, the redlining was created by FDR, a racist administration. The FDR New Deal program was the one that created redlining, so that's very, very important to just historically put on the record. But when it comes to housing supply, if you talk about St. Louis and other cities, the vast majority where these urban pockets of uh, constriction of housing supplies uh, are constricted, they're run by Democrat regulation. They're run by progressive policies that constrict the supply of housing. So if you want to have more housing supply, you need to have zoning regulation that is more competitive. And unfortunately, these areas where the worst housing supply constrictions occur are in progressive areas. Um, and so I would say that that is my recommendation in terms of improving housing supply. The other uh, massive increase in inflation is uh, energy. And so we see just recently, within the last couple of weeks, the Biden administration, again, saying we are going to constrict drilling in Alaska and other areas of the United States. Who wins in this scenario? It's OPEC that wins. It's Russia that wins. And so it's, it's so counterproductive for U.S. taxpayer dollars to go and, and fund to fight the Ukrainian war against Russia. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is, is here domestically constraining our own domestic oil prices um, and, and hitting families over and over. Thank Thank you for that. So with inflation hitting the American household, we heard a couple different no numbers there. I'm, I'm going to round it off to $5,000 a year. What are folks doing without? How are their purchasing habits changing? Because surely most of us could agree that when we're looking at 17% inflation, the, the harm most of the harm falls on working class families and the, and the poor because they're t much of their disposable income is being eradicated by by inflation and i think that would be a concern to all of us in in this room so what how how are they coping how are they what what are they doing without Sure, I would say it's the poor as well as retirees as well. Where you know, typically when you when you retire, it is your one of your highest peak um, net assets or net worth. Um, but unfortunately, because of Bidenomics and what's happened with inflation, the net worth of many seniors living on fixed income uh, is incredibly tight. And so you're seeing grandparents having to forego vacations or uh, forego helping with their grandchildren's education. You're seeing uh, people actually just dropping out of the education situation altogether, especially young men just not even going to college because it is so expensive. And unfortunately, the Biden administration's plan on student loans is, is so counterproductive. It does nothing to actually address the root cause of inflation in education. It simply takes the U.S. tax money and subsidizes the wasteful policies that are being held at the university instead of actually holding the university accountable for the rise in inflation uh, for student tuition. 
Um, so you're seeing people forego education. Uh, you're seeing them having to uh, intergenerational, you know, housing. You know, more how people within the same, you know, family, you know, grandparents and living together, um, which uh, you know could be good or bad depending on the family dynamic. But um, but yeah, people people are making do. But unfortunately, as I said earlier in my opening statement, I believe it was 52 or 54 percent of families reporting according to CNBC, reporting that they're dipping into their savings to pay for groceries and to pay for everyday expenses like rent. That is deeply unsustainable, and it is the fruit of Bidenomics. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Ms. Brown from Ohio. Oh, she's not here. All right. Well, you know why? Because Notre Dame is playing Ohio State, and she's probably trying to get ready. Um, and Notre Dame will thrash them, but that's an editor's comment. Oh, okay, okay um, the chair now recognizes Ms. Norton from D.C. I thank the chair. <clears throat> Mr. Co Mr. Colgan, um, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world faced a bleak economic future, future, high unemployment, tangled supply chains, and inflation all threatened the future of American families. But let's look at where we are now. Unemployment has stayed below 4% for 19 straight months. Grocery store shelves are full. Inflation is less than half its peak. So Mr. Kogan, would you describe the Biden-Harris economy as fairly healthy? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Yes, I would. I would say that we have had enormous progress in the past two and a half years. Yeah, low employment, uh, unemployment, inflation improving. It's hard to top that. The Treasury uh, Department has shown that the American Rescue Plan led to four million additional jobs and almost doubled GDP growth. These benefits have also served to address historical inequities and increase opportunities for all Americans. Mr. Kogan, can you expand more about how the American Rescue Plan has benefited the economy and American families, particularly those families that may traditionally be left out of economic upswings? Uh, absolutely. So uh, but, uh, the, there were two kind of main parts of the American Rescue Plan. The first was to provide assistance right then. Um, and the second thing was uh, to try to make sure that we'd have a strong job market coming out of the of, out of the COVID recession. So in the first part, it built on a lot of the bipartisan things in the Trump administration. It sent out more money to families. It continued the expanded unemployment insurance at a lower rate as, as was necessary um, at that time. It also uh, it, it, it expanded the child tax credit and kind of made it a monthly benefit to make sure that working parents were able to, and also the most vulnerable parents were able to um, help afford uh, many, uh, help better afford the cost of having children. So that sort of stuff all helped families at the time. And then by also pumping money into the economy, helping uh, invest in the future, it created the strongest job market in US history. Right now, um, there, the employment to population ratio adjusted for, um, adjusted for demographics is the strongest it's ever been. And that has redounded to the benefit of the American people. And we see that low wage earners are actually doing the best out of any cohort of folks. Well, let's turn to another one of the Biden-Harris administration's signature achievements, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Mr. Colgan, uh, this bill, which passed without a single Republican vote, has already resulted in 170,000 new jobs in clean energy and climate resilience, with projections estimating that the IRA will catalyze more than 1.5 million additional new jobs over the next 10 years. So, Mr. Kogan, how will these new jobs created by the IRA, IRA uh, improve the U.S. economy? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. So the point here is to make sure that not only could we have clean energy, we would also be able to be energy independent. And these jobs are were intended to... Re, for instance, rebuild if you had if you had a broken down coal uh, coal mine that was no longer operable. It was it was intended to turn that into something that, something that uh, would be able to uh, to work in the future, right? So may, whether it's now a battery plant or something or something like that. So these jobs are intended to be 
uh, to exist going forward in terms of our energy security and to exist for the years to come. Mr. Cogan, uh, my colleagues seem very concerned about the deficit. What effect will the IRA have on it? Um, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, so CBO scored it as saving um, about $300 billion. Uh, they, we believe that's an under underestimate because it doesn't take into account the indirect <coughs> effects of the tax enforcement. Of course, to the extent that some of that gets repealed, then some of the savings go away. Um, uh, since then, we have found that the, <coughs> some of the tax credits are going to work better than previously thought and therefore be a little bit more costly. The most recent estimates is that it might still save maybe $100 billion or something. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but that it still saves money. The Democrats' American Rescue Plan and Inflation Reduction Act are the kind of investment that the United States has needed for decades. I continue to support uh, the president and Bidenomics for investing in American communities that have faced decades of neglect. And I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Now recognizes Ms. Bobert from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses uh, who are here. I've, it's been very enlightening uh, just hearing the, the wealth of information that you all are sharing and answering the questions. Um, my, my first question is directed to you, Mr. Kogan. Um, in your testimony, you falsely claim that um, because of the trillions of dollars spent um, in the Biden administration, that America has the, quote, strongest economy recovery in more than a generation, end quote. And I just want to know, are, are you aware that just yesterday America exceeded $33 trillion in debt? Uh, this is the first time in history, $33 trillion in history. And also, are you also aware uh, that inflation's impact um, is, is on groceries um, and that is at an all-time high? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, what I was saying was that real GDP, um, mm. we are leading the pack in terms of real economic growth among the G7 nations. We are back to where CBO thought we would be, roughly, and that we've had the first V-shaped recovery of my entire life. So, so, Mr. Kogan, I, at, at $33 trillion in debt, all, all of this is due to wasteful Washington spending um, it, by Biden by Pelosi um, financed and borrowed and print uh, they, they financed and borrowed and printed money that we don't have. We are spending more than we are bringing in. And yet your testimony um, places blame on House Republicans who are working diligently to be fiscally responsible. I, we're, we're in meetings daily right now trying to get our, our fiscal house in order so we don't go off of this fiscal cliff uh, that we're all hanging on the edge of. But currently we have 20 million Americans who cannot afford their electric bill. Americans have lost more than $2 trillion in retirement savings, and gas is nearly $4 a gallon. Uh, and, I mean, that's back up again under this administration, and Americans are paying more for absolutely everything else. People are struggling. All throughout Colorado's 3rd District, this is what I'm hearing. People cannot afford to live, and this doesn't sound like the strongest economic recovery in more than a generation to me. So now, Mr. Kogan, you also state in your testimony that under this administration, quote, inflation has gone down, end quote. And I mean, this is a bold-faced lie. Americans are paying more for everything. Do you know, do you know how much American families will pay due to inflation, um, the inflation tax, in just over the next year? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, inflation, in this case, refers to the rate of inflation. That's how most folks talk about yeah, it. Yeah, but that's that. not how they feel it. That's not how they're they're actually paying for the goods and the needs uh, that, that they're trying to provide for their family, their food, their gas, uh, their electric bills, all of these things that I've mis mis mentioned. The, the correct answer for how much American families will pay for this inflation tax over the next year is $8,581. That's per family. That is absolutely absurd. And in most cases, this is more than a monthly income um, for, for most families. And, and Joe Biden has claimed um, that uh, for the past four decades, um, he has, uh, th th there has never been a, um, an economic failure. Um, and the United States has never faced an inflation crisis as severe as we are facing under the Biden uh, ad ad administration. So now, do you know how much a gallon of gas is right now compared to 2020? Um, right near me, the my gas the, my gas station right next to me is about $1.50 more. The reason it was so much lower during 
2020. Because with, President Trump had us energy independent. We were producing American energy right here, good, clean American energy. We weren't relying on OPEC as much. We were relying on the American roughneck. So that's why it was lower. I'll just answer that for you. But um, in 2020, uh, retail gas prices averaged 217 per gallon. And now we're at $3.60 up to $4.32 per gallon. I, I mean, that's a 50% increase. That is absolutely dramatic and unaffordable to average Americans who are just struggling to get by. And, and what about a gallon of milk? I mean, that was $3.32. Uh, and now, Four oh nine for a gallon of milk. Eggs. Eggs were one forty six a dozen, and now they're three forty uh, three dollars and forty four cents. That's a forty two percent increase. Families cannot afford this. Now, uh, my last question: You you also state that uh, that gains have been particularly strong among lower wage workers. Now, for the ma average American family, weekly paychecks have grown about two hundred dollars, but those larger paychecks now buy about $100 less for those, uh, for those income earners. Now, do you know the annual impact inflation has on these American workers? Uh, Congresswoman, real wages are up relative to pre-pandemic levels um, among non-supervisory and... But that number is, is a fairy tale, is it not? If, no, if you're actually spending more for the same product that you were getting, but your paycheck looks bigger but you're paying more for the goods that you were buying just a couple of years ago, uh, the result is the equivalent of a $5,600 annual pay cut. So it may look good on paper. I know engineers love that. I know bureaucrats love that. I know the folks in Washington, D.C. in the bubble love the way things look on paper. But in the real world, that does not work. Biden, Bidenomics is failing American families, and so are these policies. And I hope that you would actually t take a look into the real world rather than just on paper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you. The chair recognizes Ms. Stansbury from New Mexico. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm glad that uh, the last comments uh, wrapped up around the concept of what's happening with the economy in the real world, because the single largest threat to the economy in the real world right now is a government shutdown. And what is especially strange and ironic to me is that we're sitting here this afternoon after the majority failed to even get a continuing resolution to the floor to keep the U.S. government open, more or less pass a single appropriations bill to keep this, governing, uh, this government functioning. So if we want to talk about real world impacts, if we want to talk about people being able to pay their bills, put a roof over their head, buy groceries, and all of the things that we're talking about here today, Let's talk about funding the government and making sure that the American government and our economy can stay afloat, because that is the real world, and that is our constitutional duty and responsibility. But it's also, you know, a strange hearing that we're having here uh, this afternoon, as we are on the eve of this shutdown, and hearing a bunch of uh, distorted and strange representations of the economy. Now, I'm going to admit I'm not an economist. I am a sociologist by training. Uh, um, but I am a former OMBer, and uh, I want to welcome my colleague who also served in the budget uh, office in the White House. Um, and I know when uh, folks actually understand the economy and don't understand the economy. And uh, I just want to talk about the facts for a minute. You know, um, Mr. Uh, Kogan, I appreciated some of the charts that you included in your written testimony to the committee. And I want to make sure that we share some of those today publicly because what we're talking about is the overall macro economy. When we say that the macro economy is actually doing well in the United States in spite of this post-pandemic hangover, and we'll talk about that and its impacts here in a moment, what we're talking about is the gross domestic product. And what we see in Mr. Kogan and your testimony, you've provided this chart here, uh, which is the real GDP of the United States. Is this correct? And yeah. what do we see right here? What's happening in the year 2023? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, you can see that it is back at the trend that's uh, back where CBO thought it would be um, before the pandemic. And what you can also see on this chart is that by billions of dollars by annual rate, that we are 
above where we've previously been. So the GDP for the United States is on the rise. Now, part of the reason why we're seeing the economy come roaring back is exactly because of the policies that this body passed last, last Congress in which President Biden helped to champion. So first of all, I wanna talk about the American Recovery Plan. Now, at the height of the pandemic, we had millions of Americans who were unemployed, people who didn't know if they were gonna lose their homes. They didn't know if they're gonna be able to buy groceries. They didn't know if they were gonna be able to go to the doctor. And we passed the American Recovery Plan to get through the pandemic. It was not intended to be a stimulus in and of itself at the onset. It was meant to keep millions of Americans from falling through the crack in the most significant economic disruption that this country has seen since the Great Depression. And that is what it did. It kept millions of American people housed. It kept food on their table. It helped children get through the huge catastrophic impacts, parents. That is what the American Recovery Plan was about. Now, subsequently, we have passed three significant bills that have been causing the GDP to do this. That's the CHIPS Act, which has helped to reshore American manufacturing. It is the Inflation Reduction Act, which we've just been talking about, and it's the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is going to rebuild our roads, our water systems, and all of the infrastructure that we know our communities need to have a thriving economy. And guess what? The data don't lie. The data show us that American manufacturing and investment in American manufacturing is coming back with astounding consequences because here we are up here at the highest rate ever in American history. Finally, if my colleagues want to talk about inflation, let's compare American inflation to post-pandemic inflation in other countries. And what you can see in this chart in the testimony that has been provided to everyone on this committee is that American inflation with respect to other developing con developed countries across the world is at the lowest rates, lower than Canada, lower than the UK, and lower than most of the European community. So if our folks want to talk about facts, Let's talk about facts in the real world. The American economy is strong, it's coming back, but families are struggling. They're struggling because of the pandemic. They're struggling because we still have the effects of supply chain disruptions, of soaring housing costs and soaring food costs, and we've got to address them. And I can tell you factually, one thing that is not gonna make it better and that's shutting down this government. So if my friends on the majority wanna actually help American families, then pass the budget. And I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Langworthy from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank all of our witnesses today for being here. And uh, the media is be busy championing the administration's message of Bidenomics success. Uh, however, I spent just a ton of time traveling my uh, district, New York's 23rd Congressional District, the counties along the Pennsylvania line and the suburbs of Buffalo, speaking with my constituents and getting a real sense of their top concerns. And let me tell you, I, I didn't meet one person that thought that Bidenomics uh, was any step in the right direction for this country. Uh, but things that stood out loud and clear is that Americans are having a really difficult time affording groceries and gasoline and keeping the lights on in their home. And they're very, there's a lot of angst about the cost of, of gas and groceries. This is the reality of Bidenomics for many Americans. Uh, Mr. Antony, your extensive research on inflation has shed light on the role of as a hidden tax on American households. Uh, I'm aware of your findings indicating that this inflation tax frequently surpasses federal income taxes. Can you elaborate on how this is possible? Certainly, and thank you for the question. Uh, we have to understand that inflation, because it's a devaluation of the dollar, uh, for the sake of creating new dollars. When, when those new dollars come into existence, where did their value come from? A portion of the wealth of every other dollar that existed previously is siphoned away and goes into those, those new dollars. So as the government creates inflation, it is taking that wealth away from, from dollar holders. So that is how the government actually takes wealth away from you through the hidden, the hidden tax of inflation. And all they need to do is do this at a fast enough rate 
uh, that the amount of wealth being transferred is going to exceed the amount of wealth being transferred via the federal income tax. And this is, to be clear, this is not the first time that this has happened in our, in our nation's history. Uh, you know, this exact same phenomenon happened 40 years ago when we had very high inflation rates then as well. Thank you. And, and I'm sure we've all heard the Biden administration's promise that taxes would not increase uh, for those earning less than $400,000 a year. Would you say that he's kept his promise? No, not at all, especially when you consider the fact that inflation falls most heavily uh, on those who make lower incomes. There's a lot of different reasons for that, uh, one of which is that lower earners tend to have incomes which adjust slower to inflation, uh, but also looking at the things that, that those people buy. Uh, you know, Just one example here would be, let's say uh, someone in the middle class would buy uh, filet occasionally, but now they can't afford to, so they just buy ground beef instead. You're moving to a foodstuff which is already disproportionately purchased by people with lower income. So what you've done now is not only is there, if you want to call it an income effect, uh, from everyone having less money or less, uh, less real money due to inflation so they can afford less. But now there's also a substitution effect, if you want to call it that, where there's an increase in demand for things disproportionately bought by people with lower incomes. In other words, the prices of the things they buy go up even faster than the average. Makes a lot of sense. When we think about basic economics, we know that in times of high inflation, one, one's money doesn't go as far. Uh, one cannot buy the same amount of goods that one was able to purchase before, and often those most impacted are those with less flexibility in their budget, less uh, uh, of a backstop uh, for their own personal economy. As I mentioned earlier, during my discussions with my constituents in the district, it became abundantly clear their concerns are revolving every day about covering the essential costs of feeding their families and managing their energy bills and their transportation costs. Uh, these are everyday families who, not too long ago, they can afford a weekend getaway. They could, you know, take the kids on vacation in the summer, sign their kids up for sports teams. Uh, today, these simple pleasures, uh, these little luxuries, they've become unattainable as they grapple with the increasing burden of paying for the necessities in life. Uh, Ms. Sheffield, what should Congress be thinking about when considering the downstream impacts that the recent massive spending packages have had on American households in their expenses? Well, given that we know that the Bidenomic bills, uh, massive bills that were already passed, exacerbated inflation, my recommendation would be to contain your spending, don't pass these massive multi-trillion dollar additional bills uh, that would further exacerbate inflation. And in fact, consider supporting uh, your colleague um, recently put forward a balanced budget amendment, um, Jody Arrington. Uh, I highly recommend this because um, it certainly would put it, uh, contain not only the inflation, but it would also help the long-term trajectory of, of the congressional budget, which is um, on, you know, the interest payments alone will be, be drowning out uh, significant investments in the public good. Well, thank you very much for the testimony. I certainly have more questions, but we're out of time, and I yield back. Thank you. Members, uh, with that, I'd like to ask a unanimous consent to submit these documents and statements into the record, the impact of Biden economic policies on Americans, uh, 401k and other retirement plans by Stephen Moore and E.G. Antoni, uh, payroll tax revenue down 400 to $900 billion due to lower wages, less growth by Casey Mulligan, the cost of Biden's war on oil and gas, nearly $100 billion a year in lost output by Stephen Moore and Casey Milligan, paying Americans not to work by Casey Mulligan and E.J. Antony, and without objection, so ordered. Chair now recognizes Ranking Member Bush for her closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Despite my colleagues' claims, the U.S. economy is actually growing, and this growth directly contrast with failed Republican economy policies, policies that include the massive tax giveaway that former President Trump signed into law 2018, which prompted the most severe economic contraction in the United States since 1946 and cost the United States $1.9 billion. Republicans' economic po uh, proposals do not work and are currently driving us toward a government shutdown that will hurt families and devastate our economy. Rather than having yet another hearing to bolster Republican talking points, we should be focused on funding the government. In less than two weeks, millions of families in need will lose access to vital programs such as SNAP, TANF, WIC, 
and the administration of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid will grind to a halt because our federal workforce will be unable to serve our communities. Just a couple of hours ago, House Republican leaders postponed a vote, voting on a rule to bring a stopgap bill to the floor. We also know that a shutdown would have a devastating impact on the economy. The parcel shutdown from 2018 to 2019 reduced economic output in the United States by $11 billion over two quarters, $3 billion of which the economy never regained. The difference is clear and of massive consequence to our communities. Economic recovery should be the highest priority of the Biden administration, and we are thankful. With that, I yield back. Thank you. You know, we have um, staffs that help us with our comments um, because we're so we're spread a, lot, a little thin. But I took some notes during this hearing, and I wanted to share them with you. So you hear members from each party make claims, and then they cite statistics and studies. And if you had lived on another planet or another galaxy and you came to this hearing, you'd be scratching your head going, I don't know who to believe. So let's just talk about some indisputable facts. Number one, inflation is now at a 40-year high. Nobody can dispute that. Number two, interest rates are now at a 22-year high. That is also indisputable. Real weekly earnings have exceeded annual inflation for five of the 31 months, 84% of the time, the, during this administration. And if you want to talk about generational wealth, general, generational wealth is built on a foundation of three things to, very, to, to, to start. Number one, graduate high school. Number two, have a full-time job. And number three, do not have children until you're married. If you do those three tenets, regardless of race, religion, creed, region that you live in, it's very difficult to live below the poverty line. I'm sure CNN or MSNBC will find somebody that did all those three things and is below the poverty line, but it is absolutely the exception and not the rule. Then we talk about only federal... Um, <laughs> federal, the only federal spending program that progressive members ever want to talk about cutting is defense. That is the only one. Now, they ignore the fact that we live in a very small world, a very dangerous world, and a very interconnected world. When you cut defense, and they're, while they're all, all too comfortable, in fact, perfectly comfortable with cutting defense, they're also willing to give Ukraine a blank check for Ukrainian defense, which I find a little bit hypocritical or at least inconsistent. And then when you look at, say, 2022's deficit, which is the debt for that particular year, it's, it was $1.38 trillion. So if we didn't spend a dollar on defense, we'd still have over a half a trillion dollars in deficit spending. Defense is not the issue. In fact, defense has been the slowest growing major federal spending category since 2000. And even that 2000 year base, that base year, was following 10 years of post-Cold War cuts. So the U.S. military, uh, as a share of GDP, remains the lowest level since World War II. So more spending is not the solution to inflation, because if all of those spending programs worked as well as my Democratic colleagues have claimed, well, why did we stop at 3 or $4 trillion of spending? Why didn't we spend $40 trillion if it's so good? And then let's talk about, because the American people or my, my friend from the other galaxy that attended this hearing need to see contrasts. So my, my co colleague and ranking member mentioned about student loans. The cause in, in said that student loan forgiveness, uh, is, is she fully supports. Well, I completely disagree because it's not student loan forgiveness, it's student loan transfer. First, that program would cost, uh, and it, general consensus is it cost about $400 billion. And it would benefit, ironically, the highest earners will reap about two-thirds of that benefit, of the giveaway. And then you have to think about what, what about the folks that had never went to college? What about the folks that went to college and didn't take out a loan? What about the folks that went to college, took out the loan, and then paid it back? Is that fair to them? And the answer to that question is, of course, no. It's a patently unfair. It's patently un-American, in fact. Uh, the outstanding federal loan debt is about $1.7 trillion. There's 255 million adult Americans. 45 million have student loan debt. Though that would make, uh, make it that 210 million adult Americans would have to bear the burden for not this forgiveness, but this transfer. And the median borrower, they did a study in 1992, and they just recently did another study, and they have found the same thing. 
that about 4% of their monthly income is spent on student loans. They got plenty of money to pay off their loans. And it also sets a horrible precedent to folks that willingly went into an agreement to say, I'll borrow money and I promise, I, I promise to pay it back. And then what about future borrowers that say, hey, they give, they give loan forgiveness, they, I'll sign this thing, but I'm probably going to get forgive, forgiveness in the future. Or again, more accurately, transfer. It's simply unfair. And so we have to recognize the fact that we do have a $33 trillion debt. And I believe, I just I, from CBO, that if we continue to spend at the rate we're going now, that in 10 years, half of the federal budget will go to loan repayment, will go to paying service on the debt. That means that there's going to be less money for defense, there'll be less money for infrastructure, and there'll be less money, ironically, for entitlements. So I remember this very hyperbolic commercial that some organization put out where you had an actor playing Paul Ryan, and he was pushing grandma off the cliff. Well, it seems to me that folks that don't want to address this runaway spending, which would be my Democratic colleagues, or at least most of them, are proverbially, hyperbolically, are they pushing grandma off the cliff? Because it's going to be a heck of a lot less money for entitlements if we don't get our fiscal house in order. I want to thank the witnesses for coming today. Thank you for your testimony and your knowledge and sharing your points of view. Um, and with that, and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there is no further business and without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.